We are going to be looking this morning at verses 10 through 13. Uh, there's actually an entire passage here. I'm going to read the entirety of it so we get the context, but we're going to take three messages uh, to look at this teaching largely on giving and possessions. That's really how Paul ends uh, this book of Philippians. He focuses on this, this gift that he has received from the Philippian church, and he wants to use it as an opportunity to do some teaching on giving, to thank them, and also to teach on this idea of what we have and how the gospel transforms what we have. So we're going to look at 10 through 13 this week. Then we have a couple of guest speakers I'm very excited about, Bob Coughlin, who's the director of uh, worship for Sovereign Grace Churches and a good friend. He's going to be preaching to us next week. And then Michael Granger, who will be a church planter in Ethiopia next year, is going to be here the week after that. Very much looking forward to those two weeks. And then we will finish our study of Philippians uh, fall. Following those two guest speakers. But this morning, we're going to look at verses 10 to 13. I'm going to read the whole passage so we see the context. And let's remember as we read, this is God speaking to us. Philippians 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all. All things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. This opening expression of joy in verses 10 through 13, it reminds me of a, a, a children's book that I've read many, many times uh, to my children. It's one of those go-to uh, books in our house. Uh, it's called The Quilt Maker's Gift. I'd recommend it to you. It's all about a magical quilt maker who makes quilts for the poor and needy and a king who is passionate about stuff. Uh, so at the beginning of the book, this king is one who is so demanding of receiving things that he can have in his house that his palace is literally stuffed with all the stuff that he loves. He loves his stuff. And early in the story, uh, when he goes to the quilt maker demanding a quilt, and he says, I, I need it because it's the one thing that might finally make me happy. And the quilt maker very insightfully points out, if, if your stuff doesn't make you happy, what good is it? And he challenges, she challenges him to begin giving away his stuff and to see what effect that might have. As the book unfolds, he eventually learns the joy of giving and not idolizing his things. So that at the end, he has gone from being a, a very sad and cynical king to a, a joyful and abundantly generous king. So that by the end of the book, when he literally has given away everything he has, she comes to him with a, a magical quilt. She brings it to him and says, I told you that when you had nothing, I would bring you one of my quilts and he looks at her and says, I'm the richest man I know. I have so much joy for all the memories I've made giving things away. 
The joy and the transformation of that book reminds me of Paul in this passage. It reminds me of what he's wanting for the Philippian church, what he's celebrating in them. He wants them to know that coming to Christ affects a transformation in how we view our stuff. The king went to the quilt maker, and it's a nice story, but the Christian comes to Christ, and in coming to Christ, there is a new perspective in how we view money and stuff. The, the gospel, it transforms how we view stuff and how we view money. It transforms it. It gives us an entirely different perspective, entirely different emotions, entirely different way of evaluating what we have and what we don't have. And this passage, where he's, he's basically thanking them for a gift, he uses it to, to inspire the church through all the generations to let the gospel transform our view of what we have. Let Christ transform our view of what we have, our view of our stuff and our money. And in perhaps one of the most well-known passages of Scripture is, or of Paul's letters, it's, it's this verse about how he's able to face having much and having little because of his encounter with Christ Jesus and his strength. Ultimately, I think he writes about himself in this church to serve moving Christians away from a worldly view of stuff and towards a gospel-transformed view of stuff. And I think there's two marks that come out of this passage of the heart that has been transformed by Christ in terms of how we view our stuff. The first mark of that heart is that giving results in joy. Giving results in in joy in the heart that has been transformed by Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 10 together. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that you now at length have revived your concern for me. And as we see in the context, this is about their financial gift to help him while he is in prison. I rejoiced, Paul says, in the Lord that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Paul makes it very clear that it, his joy is not so much in the gift itself per se as it is in what it reveals about the church. As he's going to go on to clarify, I, I'm, I'm content having nothing. It's not as though the gift itself is something that I'm excited about. It's, it's what it reveals about you. I am rejoicing in what this reveals about you. And as we've seen throughout this letter, Paul loves celebrating the work of God in the heart of this Philippian church. And this is no exception. I rejoiced, he says, in the Lord, not so much that I have more provisions now, but that this reveals in you the mark of the gospel. You have revived your concern about me. And he's, he's wanting to clarify. I, I'm not meaning that you didn't have concern for me all the time, but for some reason, we don't know why, he says, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So somehow the Philippian church has been thinking about Paul, they're worried about him, they're concerned for him, but for, for whatever reason, they didn't have an ability to help him financially. And now that opportunity has come. They've sent Epaphroditus with some kind of financial support to help him, provide for him in his needs. And it is this financial expression of their partnership that gives Paul so much joy because it, it reveals something about their heart, that it's been transformed by their encounter with Jesus Christ. It's almost as if Paul is saying, I am grateful for ongoing concern, but there is a, there is a fruit of financial giving that is necessary, a necessary mark of a heart transformed by the gospel. Merely good wishes fall short of what Paul wants for this church. Uh, good wishes are, are good and, and kind and wonderful, but there's an expression of joy that comes in tangible giving that exceeds that, and we can understand why. I mean, if, if, you know, you all have had the experience when you were a kid of getting a birthday card uh, from that relative and, and opening it gingerly, hoping perhaps there might be something inside that might slide out. And then seeing happy birthday to my favorite whatever. And there's nothing. And it's nice. And you appreciate the well wishes. But when you, when you do open up and then, oh, here comes something green sliding out. 
Oh, that's delightful, isn't it? Isn't it a good thing? And you rejoice greatly in those moments. Yes, you do. Well, well Paul recognized the reality. Look, our, our checkbook reveals a, a type of friendship and encouragement and love and affection and partnership that is not revealed merely by well-wishing and concern. Our, our, our money reveals the depth of our heart in a way well-wishes simply do not. So he's, he's wanting to clarify, look, I, I know you were, you were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And now having opportunity, I'm rejoicing that you have expressed our gospel partnership in this tangible way. Their giving results in Paul's joy. And we can only imagine that he wants them to experience some of his joy in their giving as well, so that they will get a taste of for the joy that giving can produce, both their giving, others giving, the giving of the body of Christ. Paul wants the Christian church to love generosity. Paul wants the Christian church to love sacrificial giving. He wants them to rejoice in it. Notice again, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord. This is Paul describing this sphere of life that we've come into in Christ. In Christ, there is a way to experience joy, and that is by seeing giving in yourself and in others. Giving should result in joy. That's one of the things that changes when you walk into the sphere uh, that is Christ Jesus. When you see and when you experience giving, it produces joy in your heart. And not just any kind of giving, not just kind of a general benevolence, but giving to advance the gospel, in this case, to support a gospel minister, a gospel mission, there is this particular joy that Christians have in seeing the gospel go forward through sacrificial giving. He's, he's thrilled about this. He's thrilled that they have seized this opportunity. And, and honestly, that word opportunity was one of the ways um, that I felt convicted by this passage. Paul seems to assume that the issue is not whether they would want to support him, but when they have opportunity. And I thought about that from my own heart, and it struck me that, well, gosh, I can't say that I don't always have opportunity. Opportunity is not the problem. It's not an issue for me. The, the issue is whether I am eager to express my concern financially. I mean, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Do any of us lack opportunity in the way the Philippians did? Do we lack opportunity? No, we may lack an appetite for generous joy, but we don't lack opportunity. There are missions that can go for. There is, there is money that can be sent in a thousand different ways. We don't have to have a trusted messenger that can travel the miles from Philippi to Rome and hope he doesn't get robbed along the way. No, no, we don't, we don't have to do any of those things. There, there's ways we can provide and support all around us the mission of the gospel, and yet sometimes it is not the opportunity that is lacking, but our desire to rejoice in the giving that should mark every Christian. Paul says, I, I rejoice. I rejoice not, not in a full stomach, per se, not in having my supplies met, per se, but in yet another evidence that the work of Christ is present and alive in this church that he loves. I rejoice, Paul says, that you have revived your concern for me. It should be our holy ambition that our giving produce this same kind of gospel-centered joy, that this mark of the gospel that causes rejoicing should be true because of us. This should be our ambition. This should be your ambition to produce this kind of gospel rejoicing, that, that it could be true of us, what is true of the Philippian church, that there is great joy that our concern for the advance of the gospel has been demonstrated tangibly in giving. We should have a holy jealousy and ambitious desire for verse 10 to be true of our giving. There should be some ability somewhere for the work of the gospel to be able to be said of us, we rejoice in the Lord because of your concern expressed tangibly in support. We should want that to be true of us because we should want the evidence of a transformed heart in Christ to be shown in the ways that we give. But, but, 
there is a related mark that is crucial to our ability to be generous. We will only be generous with what we have if we view what we have with contentment. We will only be generous with what we have when we view what we have with contentment. If, if we don't have the right view of our stuff, we certainly will not want to give our stuff away. If we don't have the right view of our money, we certainly won't want to give our money away. We have to have a right view of our stuff in order to give our stuff in order to support the advance of the gospel. So the two marks that I think stand out in this passage, number one is that giving results in generosity or in joy, giving results in joy. And the second mark is that every situation reveals contentment. What, what, what is true about the Christian who has come to know the Lord Jesus? Two things are true, Paul would say. For that person, giving results in joy. And for that person, every situation reveals contentment. That's true of the Christian. Giving results in joy. It causes joy. It doesn't cause concern or anxiety. It causes joy. And for that person, every situation, the highs and the lows, the abundance and the hunger, reveals contentment. It reveals a heart that is satisfied, that is at peace, that is at rest, that is not fixated on stuff. I was struck by a quote by the author Randy Alcorn, who has wrote, written extensively about money. He says this, What you do with your resources in this life is your autobiography. What you do with your resources in this life is your autobiography. If I could back up from that phrase and say, how you view what you have in this life will determine what you do with them. How you view what you have in this life will determine what you do with them, and what you do with them, says Alcorn, is your autobiography. Challenging and provoking, isn't it? It's provoking to hear that, and yet I think Paul would agree. Paul would agree. He's rejoicing in their giving, and he wants them to rejoice in it as well. He goes on to say, I am thrilled at the fruit that abounds to your credit, and my God will supply every need of yours, he says. But then he wants them to understand the reason I can have this kind of joy and would have a peace even if the gift didn't come to me is because I view my stuff through the lens of my satisfaction in Christ and his strength. Let's look at this next section. Every situation reveals contentment for the heart that is transformed by Christ. He says in verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need. He wants to clarify that his joy is not a joy that rises because of his greater possession of stuff, but rather a joy in their mark of giving because he has a contentment regardless of what God has given to him. I am not speaking, he says, of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Whatever situation I am, Paul says, I can be content. And then he explains, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty, here's the contrast again, and hunger, abundance and need. And then here's the secret, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now that verse, verse 13, is powerful if understood correctly. You probably have heard athletes and various celebrities and so forth uh, who have some kind of Christian background. Uh, they'll use it in ways I think is extremely unhelpful. Uh, I can do all things is referring to the all things Paul was just describing, namely having a lot or having nothing. I can do all things. He, he paints this broad spectrum, whether I have an abundance or whether I have nothing. We don't know of a lot of situations where Paul had an abundance, uh, but he is able to deal with that situation in a godly way, and he's able to deal with having nothing in a godly way. He's, he's painting this full spectrum. Whether I have a lot or nothing or something in between, I can handle that situation through Christ who strengthens me. 
What, what this verse is not saying is that Christ intends to turn Christians into superheroes doing things they can't naturally uh, do in the material world. I can dunk through Christ who strengthens me. No, you can't. No, you can't. I can jet ski through Christ. No, you can't. No, you can't. I can cook through Christ who strengthens me. No, you can't. It has nothing to do with, with gifts and abilities and a kind of you know, overcoming natural limitations. No, that, that's not the point. The point here is I can glorify Christ whether I have a lot or a little. I can do all things. I can face all things. I can be content in all things. I can have a lot and be satisfied in Christ and not the lot that I have. I can have a little and be satisfied in Christ, not the lot that I could have. I can, I can face either of those extremes through the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you understand it that way, it's actually a profound and powerful statement. It's not the superhero verse of the New Testament. It's actually the contentment verse of the New Testament. It's the verse that comes to the person who just lost their job and says, you can face this in a godly way because I will give you strength. It's the person who just gets a promotion and is trying to understand, how do I deal with this abundance in a way that glorifies God? How do I not be uh, basically tempted and entrapped by my newfound abundance. Well, God will give you strength. How do, I, how do I deal with having more than I think I need? God will give you strength. How do I avoid the temptation of materialism? God will give you strength. How do I deal with the fact that we just lost the one car we thought worked well and we're down to the other one that doesn't work well? God will give you strength in Christ. How do I deal with not knowing about retirement in the future? I don't have an abundance in that regard. God will give you strength. How do I deal with having a washer but no dryer? God will give you strength. I can do all things. All things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul, Paul seems to imply that there is a real need presented by having an abundance and a real need presented by having need. And don't we know the reality of that? I mean, the, the whole Bible presents to us the overwhelming teaching of the Bible on money is be careful, money is dangerous. It's not bad. It's not ungodly. It can be used with profound beneficial effect. It is not inherently sinful. It's just that it's dangerous. It's, it's not something that we should run away from. No, please don't give me that promotion. No, no. Money is evil. No, no. It's not that it's bad or sinful. It's that as soon as you have it, recognize, recognize you're in a danger zone. It's dangerous. That's why Jesus says to his disciples, it is, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Be warned, the epistles say, against the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not bad, it's not sinful, it can be used to the glory of God in enjoying his creation, in blessing others primarily, in serving the advance of the kingdom. This is not a, a message about stoicism, uh, avoiding all of the enjoyments of this age. Go live in the desert somewhere and don't you dare use electricity. No, no, that's not what this passage is saying. It is saying that stuff, having it and having money is a temptation. Whether that stuff for you is this land that you've always wanted and that you've been saving for all these years and finally, yes, I have my land or it's that big screen TV that you've always wanted you save for or the house so that all the kids have their own bedroom. Oh, I've wanted that so much. Those might all be good things. But Paul says, look, if you have an abundance, be aware you need the strength of Christ to be content in that situation. Or the person who's still living in a one-bedroom apartment with their four children and says, this seems unreasonable, God. And Paul says, you can do it through Christ who strengthens you. Having a lot of stuff tempts the Christian to love that stuff more than Christ. Not having a lot of stuff tempts the Christian to want that stuff more than Christ. Stuff replaces Christ all the time, whether you have it or you don't have it. 
The person can pine after what they don't have in the same way that a person can indulge themselves in what they do have. Neither of those people are enjoying the strength of Christ because they've fixated themselves on stuff or money. The heart that rises and falls with a bank account. The joy that rises and falls with a pleasant decor. Look, those things are good and can be pleasing to the Lord and useful to others, but not as a replacement of Christ. Stuff is a useful tool. Money is a useful tool and a terrible Savior. A terrible God. Money is a a gift from the Lord, not a Lord in itself. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, look, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. This is like one of Paul's caveats. He's always doing this. Here's what I think, but, but don't misunderstand. Look, I'm, I'm not thrilled right now because it's sweet to be flush. No, I'm content whether I have nothing. I'm on some road fighting malaria and journeying through these towns preaching the gospel. Or, as I am right now, when I'm celebrating the kindness of the church to provide for me what I need here in this prison. I'm able to rejoice in that and celebrate the generosity of God and the generosity of his people. That's a a way where I am expressing back to God, reflecting back to him thanks. And and that's a good thing, and I want to use this abundance as a, a, a springboard to thankfulness. I wanted to give, give credit to the glory of God and the work of the church. I want to use stuff in the right way. But it's not the stuff. It's that Christ strengthens me in this moment. Having, not having is irrelevant. It's all about the strength of Christ helping me to be satisfied in him and to view it the right way. I've learned In whatever situation I am to be content, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, could Paul be more categorical? In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul looks at the Thanksgiving table laden with a feast and a single tuna can in a little apartment somewhere. And he says, Christ has given me strength. Paul is satisfied in Christ. This is the the material, material angle of what he said earlier in the book. For me to live is Christ. For me, in terms of stuff, to live as Christ. To live as Christ. Sometimes the Lord wants me to have more stuff, probably so I can bless others, and sometimes he doesn't. He doesn't change, and that's all I need. Isn't this secret something that we need to embrace, that we need to enjoy, that we need to reject the idea that stuff is our contentment, that money is our peace, that what we have is the strength that we need? Isn't this a, a secret that we need? This is, this is delightful. It's not like Paul says, how dare you have stuff? No, because we could legitimately say, no, this, this stuff, I, I think I have a vision for it to be used for your kingdom, used for your people. I'm not just deceiving myself. I have a token giving so that I can enjoy my mansion. No, no, no. I, I, I actually think this has good uses in your kingdom, Lord. I, I actually think I can now give sacrificially and, and show hospitality, and I, I want to use this for your glory. And those moments where God calls you to give up your stuff, either voluntarily or providentially. Because you're free from the love of stuff, You can embrace his providential removal of stuff, or you can choose to give up stuff voluntarily if that's what will serve the kingdom of God. Isn't this a delightful secret? Christ transforms how we view what we have. 
he replaces the love of stuff with himself and his strength. I can do all things, all circumstances, having, not having, through Christ who strengthens me. This puts a new spin on Alcorn's quote. What we do with what we have is our spiritual autobiography. Why is that true? It's true because what we do with what we have reveals how much we value Christ. How we think about what we have is our spiritual autobiography. Why? Because it reveals how much we value Christ and his strength. How we view our losses, how we view our gains, how we view our giving, how we view our having and our not having, it is our spiritual autobiography because it reveals how much Christ matters to us. And the Christ Paul refers to should matter to us infinitely. Because he is the one who, though he was rich, became poor. Who emptied himself by taking on our flesh. Who lived in the indignity of human form as the divine son. And functioned in this kind of body and in this world. Knowing nothing of the abundance that he had in heaven. And experiencing the limitations and weakness so that he could quite literally say... I was content in abundance and content in need in order to save you. And this is the Christ who strengthens us. It's it's the Christ who could say on the cross, I thirst because he could be dehydrated. It's the Christ who could say, it is finished and die because he had a heart that needed to beat. It's the Christ who would carry the weight and burden and guilt of our sins and in that strength could deliver us from hell into heaven. This is the Christ who strengthens that Christian who lives with a single tuna can in a small apartment somewhere and the Christ who strengthens the wealthy person who needs to learn how to give out of their abundance to serve others. This is the Christ who saves us from the sins of idolatry in order to free us for the joy of contentment in loving him more than we love our stuff. What a secret to master. Brothers and sisters, let me lay before you a challenge. Master this secret. Master it. Make it part of your identity. Examine ways that it's not and bring those to Christ. Bring them to the one who died in our place for our sins to rescue us from the idolatries of this age so that he can free you to enjoy the secret of his strength. Listen, if you have a lot of stuff, and most of us here do, Begin to ask the question, is my stuff the reason I'm content? And if so, perhaps, perhaps I should take a step in experiencing the joy of giving. Perhaps I should be careful that my stuff is not replacing Christ at the center of my heart. Listen, if you have needs, if you have real needs and it's uncertain how those needs are going to be provided for, be careful that your needs don't replace your contentment in Christ. It's one thing to ask for his provision. It's right to work hard to provide for your family. It's right to labor. We do not live waiting for God to send down manna. No, we we work and we labor and we, we do good at our work and we serve our employers. And yet that should not change the contentment of our heart. Is Christ transforming our view of what we have? Does our joy and generosity and our contentment in all situations show a heart transformed by Jesus Christ? Listen, for those of you, and I don't know who you are because by intention, we don't know who gives in this church, which I, I love that policy. For those of you who give faithfully, unfortunately, I don't know your name, but I rejoice that God is doing that work of his gospel in your heart. I rejoice in you. If you give sacrificially, regularly, faithfully to the work of the gospel, either in this church or if you're a guest in your home church, 
Listen, I rejoice at the work of Christ in your heart to free you from the love of stuff in order to give to his kingdom. I rejoice over that in you. I, I rejoice that we're able to do things like sending Aaron and some of these folks to Nepal, and I'm going to Mexico to serve all these pastors this week, and work this week on a sermon, and we're able to labor in counseling and care and discipleship. Why? Well, because people don't love stuff so much in this church. So I rejoice over that. If, if you're one of the faithful givers to the work of the gospel here, I, like Paul, am rejoicing that the work of the gospel has done its effect in your heart. And I would urge you, let it do so more and more. Let, let us become like our forefathers who didn't ask, uh, how much can we give, but how much do we need to live on? And let's give away the rest. Listen, if, if you're here, and, and this isn't a, a, an area of godliness or, or maturity for you, we all have areas of weakness and immaturity. All of us. I do. All the other pastors do. All the leaders here in this church do. But let me, let me urge you, th this is a joy you want to get in on. You, you don't want your spiritual biography to be, I would have given eventually. You want it to be, I gave sacrificially and I trust the Lord for contentment with not knowing how to do without that. Listen, don't, don't, don't soothe your conscience by token giving. Renew your conscience by sacrificial giving. I think it's one of the most unhelpful things in the world when, when Christians or people who kind of occasionally attend church, they'll come on Christmas Eve and they'll kind of drop 20 bucks in the basket. And I think, oh, you're just, you're just soothing your conscience. You don't want that autobiography. The spiritual ledger of Satisfied in Christ says uh, an annual donation of 20 bucks. Or, you know, that, that, that's not what you want the ledger to be. That doesn't speak well of the treasure of Christ. So if, if you're here and you, you don't give faithfully, either here or your home church or somehow, listen, let's, let's experience the joy of giving sacrificially. If you have no idea how to do that or the, the budgeting concerns, look, there's people in the church that would love to talk to you. Any of the pastors would be happy to set up some kind of financial counseling for you to help you in that way. But, but spiritually speaking, let me urge you to take that step to find your treasure in Christ through the joy of giving. For this issue of contentment, let me, let me ask us to take inventory of our view of stuff. What's something right now that you have that you think you could find joy in instead of contentment in Christ? doesn't mean you should go home and sell it. I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying maybe it's something to bring to the Lord and saying, Lord, this is in your hands. I, I'm grateful for this, but if it can be used in a better way, I, I release it to you. This is, I am not about this. Maybe it's your dream house. I'm not saying you should move, but you should certainly say to the Lord, Lord, this is in your hands, Lord. Maybe it's your dream car or your dream outfit or, uh, you know, the new bench you got. I, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, what is it? It's, it's a new level in the bank account. There's something good about going to the Lord and saying, Lord... I don't need this. I have you. My contentment is not in this. I'm grateful for it. I pray you use it for your glory. Uh, thank you for it, Lord, but it's not in this. Lord, if you want me to give this away or you want to take this for some reason, Lord, my contentment is in you. Or, or what about if there's that thing that you don't have yet but you really want? You know, one of the worst things about Amazon is it's like ready-made contentment challengers. I can just browse and be tempted endlessly with all the things it would be nice to have. Now, I love Amazon. <laughs> Amazon saves me time, okay? And time's useful for the Lord. So I'm, 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 I'm not against Amazon. I'm just saying, you know what I mean. Isn't it easy to say, oh, that would be awesome to have. <laughs> and there's 19 versions. <laughs> and I don't even have to pick them They'll show them to me. They will show me what I want. And there's, there's an important spiritual antenna that should go up right there, isn't there? You know what would be a great spiritual discipline exercise? Go to Amazon, start browsing, and just say to the Lord, I don't need that. 
I don't need that. I'm content in you. If I never have that, I'm content in you. Go around your house. Pick your favorite stuff. Go to it. Stand there and say to the Lord, I don't need this. If you took this away or you want me to give it to somebody, that's fine. I'm content in you. I can not have this through Christ who strengthens me. Go to your car. Not the one you hate, the one you love. <laughs> Go to your car. <laughs> and say, I don't need this. If you want me to give it away, I can do that through Christ who strengthens me. Go to your bank account. Go to your retirement. Go to your inheritance. Whatever that is for you. Look at the number and say, I don't need that. I cannot have that through Christ who strengthens me. Or pick a number that you'd like to be there and say, I don't need that. I can never have that through Christ who strengthens me. Wouldn't that be a healthy, regular discipline to do? Just as a heart check, is this secret working its way into my soul, Lord Jesus? Is there anything that, oh man, I, I really like that or I really wish I could? Oh, let me just say to you, Lord, I don't need that. L listen, we're never going to have a, an abundant record of generosity or surprising sacrificial giving or care for one another or even just an abundant love for the Lord Jesus if at the same time we're holding on to our desires unrealized or fulfilled with an arm on the side and trying to worship Jesus with the other hand. We have to let it go and say to him, I am content, having, not having. Let me ask about everything I have, every dollar, every piece of furniture, automobiles. Lord, would it help your kingdom for me to have this? Would it bring glory to you? Are you intending to bless us with this? God's not a miser. He's not saying, I expect you to live in a cave and anything else is bad. No, no, we can enjoy what God's given, but with a hand free to worship him. I know, Paul says, and I think he would say to us, learn. Trust me, it is a better way to live. Learn. Learn how to be content with having and not having. Learn the joy of celebrating giving in your own budget and life and in the lives of the church. Learn the secret because the only way you can learn that secret is by knowing Christ Jesus. He is the treasure of our souls. And that treasure is valuable enough to satisfy us with whether we have or don't have, whether we are hungry or full. Our focus and our satisfaction is found in Him. Let Christ transform how we view what we have. Let's pray. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Lord Jesus, cause us to learn the secret of contentment in you. Strengthen us to deal well with abundance and well with need. Give us joy in giving, joy in the generosity of the church. May we long to participate, Lord. 
Lord, cause us not to hear your word and remain unchanged, remain discontented, remain materialistic. Lord, we have heard your word speak to us out of your goodness and your kindness. And Lord, I pray that immediately we would respond. We would say like the obedient child, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Here, Lord. Here is what we own. Here is what we have. Here is what we want to have. Here is what we wish we could have. Here is our, our budget, Lord. Here, Lord, it is yours. We are content in you. Receive the glory. Do this in our church, Lord, I pray. Cause us to be a, a giving church free of the love of stuff. And full of the love of you. In Jesus' name we pray.